First up, we have Diane Vosick. She is the Director of Policy and Partnerships for Ecological Restoration for the Ecological Restoration Institute at NAU. Um, she works with policymakers, environmental stakeholders, business interests, and land managers to achieve the goal of ecological race restoration in frequent fire forests. Welcome, Diane. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Because I can't hear. Okay, great. Okay. Why isn't this working? Which one? There we go. Okay. Okay. This is Meteor Crater near Winslow, Arizona. It formed 50,000 years ago when an asteroid hit the Earth at a rate of 26,000 miles per hour. It's estimated to be about a mile across and 550 feet deep. And it holds an estimated 82 million cubic yards of material. And just to give you a little sense of the scale, that's the Statue of Liberty at 300 feet. That's the Empire State Building at 1,200 feet. And that's the University of Phoenix Stadium, go Cardinals. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make, you're, you're wondering, so what does Meteor Crater have to do with anything related to this conference? The point I'm trying to make is to drive home just how challenging the economics of restoration really are. Because think of it this way. Uh, a logging truck, a biomass removal truck, can carry 82 cubic yards of material that's at 50% moisture. That represents one acre of biomass from northern Arizona. Our goal is to restore one million acres, which means that when we complete our project, we can fill Meteor Crater. The problem is we can't do anything with this biomass that fills Meteor Crater, and yet it's one of the most important things we need to remove in order to restore our forests. So going back to the question of this particular conference, what's working, what isn't, our economic framework for restoring forests is not working. It's not working from the public land management side very effectively, and it's not really working from the private sector side very effectively as well. And so by the end of this discussion, I want to present some ideas that um, we need to get going on in order to accelerate the pace and scale of restoration. And I'm going to start with the past. As we all know, the conventional model for the Forest Service, I'm going to focus on the Forest Service primarily, but the conventional model for the Forest Service up until the 80s was that trees would pay. And this is a picture of railroad logging from Coconino National Forest in 1907. And those are big trees. And they could create, they could be made into beautiful dimensional lumber. But here's the problem. We thought when we started at the Four Forest Restoration Initiative, and I'm speaking for many stakeholders, that once we got the social agreement to move forward on forest restoration and thin our forests, that we would just, that somehow there'd be this Shazam moment and we would be able to re-energize industry, harvest infrastructure, and all the things that had gone away um, when things collapsed in the 90s. But we were naive about two very important aspects. One was that the trees themselves were not very valuable. And the second is that it is a heavy lift to bring industry back where it is completely collapsed. This is one of our research sites at the Ecological Restoration Institute at Gus Pearson. So when we restored this particular site, and those of you that are graduate students can appreciate this project, we counted, not me actually, the grad students, counted 1,254 trees on this site. But historic reconstruction and this particular restoration, we left 23 trees. All the rest of that stuff was this biomass. And that's a small pile compared to what we are generating every day when we restore in this forest. 
So we have biomass that is zero value to negative value every, every time you touch it. And then you have the small diameter trees that Mike's talked about and Dick's talked about that really don't lend themselves to a lot of value either. So this is a, a breakdown of what you can get out of these trees. Our products tend to lean to the left side, poles, posts, and pallets. And those are not only lacking in value, our, Mexi our market is Mexico. And everybody we bring on in the Southwest that's trying to market stuff is marketing it to Mexico at this point. So it is very, very difficult to turn a profit on these materials. We don't really get um, dimensional lumber. We do get cans, but those aren't particularly valuable either. We have one pellet operator in Arizona, but uh, he struggles and frankly, we need better transportation to other markets to make that viable. And then in the, on the front of bioenergy and biofuels, we have one biomass plant that has um, gone under twice and is presently operating with purchase power agreements from two utilities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the many different economic changes that have to occur in order for this to work. And um, they're going to they're gonna go to the agency's involvement, to the private sector's involvement, and then also what kind of policy remedies are really important to change in order for us to move forward. So um, I'm going to start right here with reorienting the, the agency. And Dick talked briefly about this. He had a lot to cover. This is actually a list Dick generated. Don't read it. It's just mind boggling. But what it is are the 25 steps between a signed record of decision. And as Dick pointed out, we have 600,000 acres ready to go to the point at which an award, a contract is awarded. Most of these steps relate to valuing the trees. It is a legacy of a time when trees had value. And we spend an incredible amount. In fact, uh, we have a guy working with the Nature Conservancy, the Forest Service, and ERI doing a time study. 288 days is one of his current estimates about what it takes after NEPA to start getting to this point. And as Dick pointed out, the real value is in the restored acre. And if we start thinking about reverse engineering, getting to that restored acre and prepping for that restored acre, it really turns on its head some of those 25 steps that we now labor through and are really uh, a drain on the Forest Service already stretch capacity to move forward with restoration. Another thing that we need to do is we need to improve agency efficiency starting from the point at which NEPA is um, initiated. We've been arguing ERI and other stakeholders for the use of LIDAR more widely. If we start with LIDAR at the assessment point, you get better volumes and better structural information. And that can actually carry through all the way to the contract. And from an interest, industry standpoint, that con uh, figuring out what kind of volume you're dealing with for your contract is incredibly important and made more accurate. In addition, Technology such as drones can be used while you're cutting in terms of monitoring what's cutting so you have le less pressure on your staff, as well as post-implementation monitoring to get at some of your ecological responses. The Forest Service is lagging behind other public agencies in developing a policy as it relates to the use of drones in its operations. We all know, too, that we need new markets and new products. And there's a chicken and an egg here. And my next part of this discussion will be about what investors need. But we know that, um, for example, bio, biomass has applications with respect to biofuels. And there's some promising developments in that regard with respect to um, Alaska Airlines and Southwest Airlines using a biofuels mix in their jet fuels. There's also the possibility of um, converting this to biochar, as we, I'm glad it's biomass week. I'm glad biochar is here. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> but um, from the standpoint of getting it to the commercial viability that we need in northern Arizona to do one million acres of restoration, we're still struggling. We have recently, and this is something that we've had in northern Arizona 
since 1998, people who come to the dance, but they never get out on the floor. We have lots of investors that have come and talked to us about all this wood that's out there. But then when they start teasing apart what needs to happen, a different reality begins to set in. The most recent um, investor is somebody talking about an oriented strand board plant, great for low value wood. But he wants, he's gonna have to put $250 million into his plant to make it work. So to do that, he'll want local government to provide him with an industrial revenue bond. That's a public-private partnership, that's okay. He also wants a large contract. Well, that starts getting a little sc scarier because all of a sudden you got one guy commanding all the wood coming into, uh, coming out of the forest. The other thing that people want is a 20 year guaranteed contract. And that's something Congress will have to change. That's, a, that's currently limited to 10 years. So we have a policy intervention that's needed. Then you start scratching below that. And there's, a, there's concern, well, gosh, all my supply in northern Arizona is going to come off the Forest Service land. And if you look around the country, the su su successful model for other businesses is to have a variable supply of private and public land. And then you get dig down one more and people say, well, what if we're litigated further down the line? What if Congress changes the rules? Um, what if it burns up? And then what you have is a business that wants a fair amount of risk sharing with government. So finding the right suite of appropriately scaled industry and the right package of incentives to move that forward is not something we've cleverly achieved quite yet in northern Arizona. I like, I'd like to point out though, as Dick did, where industry has not collapsed it's a little bit easier because you already have some stuff in the ground that lets you build out. And uh, we've seen this in our east, in the White Mountains, and I've noted this in Oregon, where even when you're down to two mills, at least you've got two mills that you don't have to capitalize to move forward. And then, um, as we've people have touched on, there are innovative funding schemes. And um, in Flagstaff, we're particularly proud of the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project. And I'm gonna spin a little story about this because it sets up for some other ma more major things that need to happen to make this work. So in June of 2010, what happened in Flagstaff is we added ignition on the San Francisco peaks. And that particular fire burned 50,000 acres very, very quickly. And it was a severe fire, um, but fortunately, with $9.4 million of federal suppression efforts, we didn't lose a single house. We did not lose, there were no fatalities. But 29 days later, we had a historic monsoonal event that parked itself right over the burn area. And as a result, sent floodwaters, mud, and debris cascading into the communities below. And it, that was devastating. We lost a 12-year-old child. Um, the, the, uh, debris, the, the whole circumstance was just a shock to our community. There wasn't anybody who didn't know somebody who hadn't been affected by this. So the Ecological Restoration Institute, in cooperation with Coconino County and also the Rural Policy Institute, decided to do a full cost accounting of that fire trying to turn over every rock to demonstrate that it's not just about fire. It's not a one-time event. And so, as I mentioned, we had a $9.4 million suppression effort, but when all was said and done and we turned over every rock and every cost and every personal cost associated with what it took people to fix up their houses and everything else, our bottom line figure was 133 million to 146 million dollars for this fire. If we had treated every single acre of the Schultz fire at a thousand bucks per acre, and that's a pretty much Cadillac expenditure, and you don't need to treat every acre to be able to break up fuel continuity, so we wouldn't have to do that we would have spent $15 million and saved ourselves $115 million and one 12 year old. It's a good investment and we don't talk enough about the avoidance of cost associated with these fires. So with that shocking realization, 
the city of Flagstaff and uh, a whole bunch of us got together to create the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project. It's a $10 million bond issue. It's the only one in the country where people have voted to tax themselves with bonding in order to provide money to the federal government to get the land treated that would inundate the downtown Flagstaff. The Schultz fire was on the east side of the San Francisco peaks. Had it been on the south side of the San Francisco peaks, it would have sent that same debris right into the city of Flagstaff. And one conservative estimate um, that has been prepared by uh, the Rural Policy Institute is that would cost Flagstaff $1.2 billion if it were the same fire and flood event as happened in the Schultz fire. It's worth it. So how are we going to get this biomass out of the woods? There are some important policy interventions that can occur. One is that every time you haul this stuff, it just costs you money. There is a reauthorization of the Farm Bill coming up next year. And one of the programs people have effectively used is called the um, BCAP program, Biomass Crop Assistance Program. It provides a subsidy for both the removal and the hauling of biomass out of the woods when it's being done for preventative purposes. Unfortunately, um, Typical of many farm bill programs, it's more oriented to production, agriculture, corn stubble, other things that people remove uh, to biomass ethanol plants. It needs to be tweaked to make more effective for sites in the West. But that is an open opportunity, open game this year. In addition, it would be helpful if we could come to some kind of policy agreement about whether or not biomass is carbon neutral. There was a rider put into the omnibus bill um, at the end uh, for FY17 that has um, directed federal agencies to start developing rules that would, would endorse this idea of biomass being carbon neutral. But even if we don't want to look at it as a fossil fuel offset, just the mere fact that it makes more sense to burn this in a point source where you're not putting smoke into, the, into a community, you can generate electricity from it. Um, and you can and you can um, con control the outputs is is an argument for biomass. The only the problem is it doesn't pencil. And one of the things we're hoping and working with in, in Flagstaff is talking to our local Camp Navajo U.S. Guard, U.S. Um, National Guard and Department of Defense facility to look at biomass as a 24/7 secure ener energy grid fuel because they can afford to offset the money you lose when you do biomass. And then finally, I'd just like to wrap this around with the idea that we're very proud of what we've done in the Flagstaff Watershed Protection Project. We have $10 million of public money. We're going to treat 10,000 acres. We have a whole heck of a lot more acres to treat. And, and in some senses, these, some of these innovative schemes are like holding a bake sale to try and get at a huge societal problem. This year, we've already exceeded the federal, um, fire, uh, federal budget for fire suppression. Um, it's been the worst year in, the last, in, in recent times, if not the worst year over time, uh, on record. Um, the, it's estimated that in, as of Saturday, the one estimates $85 billion worth of damage in California. And California is a very different case. But this, this same scenario plays out over and over and over across the Intermountain West. And then let's think about it for a minute. This is just the discretionary part of our federal budget. So that's one third of our entire budget. It's $1.15 trillion. Forest Service budget this year is $5.1 billion. It's less than 1% of even our discretionary budget. And yet, arguably, we can say that restoring our forests is as important as many things we pay for in our federal budget. It's a health issue. It's a safety issue. It's an environmental issue. It's a water issue. All the benefits that accrue from restored forests are worth investing more in terms of our public funding for our agencies to get this work done. 
so recognizing that we need to redouble what it is we're doing because the likelihood of a simple solution like this is pretty unlikely. Thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> Anybody want my IT guy's name? Because he's really good at doing stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, Jesse. He's right there. Let me, I, I, let me take a stab at it, and then I'd like Dick to add in. Um, for, the question is, um, so in Arizona, we had uh, one of the innovations that was pushed for very early by people who really wanted to catapult um, for Fry Ford was let's do a large 300,000 acre contract with the idea that if you, if you build it, they will come. In other words, if there's a guaranteed 300,000 acres out there, people will put investment in the ground. There were, um, there were only two viable, viable proposals that were sent in for the contract, neither of which party were in the wood business. I asked my friends up in Oregon, why isn't anyone bidding on this contract now, this was before the big EIS was done, and he said to me, are you crazy? Um, first of all, the EIS isn't done. Why would anyone in the business that knows anything at all about litigation want to bid on this contract? And then the second point was that um, that sole source federal, federal wood is a high risk proposition for industry. So the Forest Service was left with two people who had no experience in the woods with, their, with these two proposals. And um, beyond that, I can't, I don't, not an insider in the Forest Service, so I can't tell you why one was picked ov over the other. But I'd also like to point out, although we have this OSB plant sniffing around right now, it's a very wood hungry proposal, and I don't know what the social acceptance would be. This guy wants 50,000 acres of wood a year, and that would be, a, that would make some people very uncomfortable. Dick, do you want to? Yeah, it's it's one of the we all do, you know it was a it was an experiment that I'd say didn't turn out the way anybody expected it to turn out. Yeah, Tony. Then there's a, uh, it's been several published papers recently by uh, primarily research ecologists, a lot of our colleagues in the field that are basically saying we just have to live with fire. Right? There's no, right, there's, there's no, there's not enough money in the discretionary budget to meet all those restoration needs. Why are we even, why are we even bothering with it? Why not just armor ourselves to the Well, there are about 17 answers to that question. <laughs> the first
first off, I would just like to say we are underinvesting, completely underinvesting in the problem. It took us 120 years to get to this point, and we've expected to solve this problem. People woke up in 96. And so, and you know, you saw the you saw Jesse's presentation about just the shrinkage of the agency in charge with managing this. We're coming through a bottleneck of litigation. I actually feel fairly optimistic about where we're moving in terms of social acceptance to keep going. The problem is we just aren't investing. We know what to do. That in fact, um, I don't know how many environmental problems we have where we have so much science to support moving forward. The, the other thing is, we, rather than just go immediately to the let's throw up our hands and not do anything, we haven't even begun to think, and, and Dick knows this because we chew on the, for, we ERI chew on the Forefry team about this. I mean, there are more tools out there to start targeting and thinking about, okay, if we know we're going to have megafire, where do we need to be putting treatments that can get to those assets on the landscape? And by assets, I mean like threatened species habitat for Mexican spotted owls that took it in the chops in the wallow fire. We need to be out there looking at the things that are most irreplaceable and targeting our efforts that way. But those efforts are not going to pay their way out of the woods. In general, you're looking at really complicated things to do, but it's worth it. The, the water issues, they're worth it. We can't walk away. And the other thing that I think sometimes happens is that um, the, the, fact, the fact is fire is a great tool, but it's a blunt forced instrument under a lot of circumstances. And so you have to be very careful. And the other thing is don't let Congress off the hook. Um, in 2014, we testified in Congress on it. We looked at the efficacy of treatments. In other words, the Office of Management budget at the time was saying, hey, look, we got suppression costs here. We got treatment costs here. They don't, these treatment costs aren't affecting our suppression costs. So why don't we just quit this charade of treatments? And so Senator Wyden went apoplectic over that. There was a hearing. Our study was brought in showing third-party research that, in fact, where treatments are, they, in fact, are effective. Um, but that's the kind of dialogue that goes on. And we also pointed out that this is an apples and oranges discussion. It doesn't even work that way. But um, we can't let Congress off the hook. We, we don't, you know. Um, we don't treat a lot of other expenditures in our federal budget the way we treat land management, period. Yes? Well, I guess I just wonder what it takes because, like you mentioned, you know, it's not the only problem where we totally underinvest in preventing the problem or preparing ourselves for the problem, but we're willing to spend, you know, millions, if not billions. You know, once the hazard, the natural hazard is broken out, once the fires happen, the flood, the earthquake, whatever, we'll, we'll spend all this money on trying to respond in this kind of reactionary mode. And so, what does it take to kind of shift that mindset to, you know, keep the problem at the political forefront and try and better invest in restoration to prevent these you know, mega fires from happening and killing people and, and et cetera? How do you see shifting that? I think raising the alarm that it's a public safety issue in a much bigger way, perhaps even a national security issue, might make a dent in that mentality. Um, you know, when we were putting the on the Flagstaff ballot, the um, ballot initiative, even our Tea Party member of the city council voted for it because he said, this is a public safety issue and it's the role of government to um, organize public safety. And so perhaps we're not talking about it as effectively as we could. I would also say there was a time back in the early aughts when you know we started sobering up to fire after the Los Alamos fire, Hayman fire, Rodeo Chetiskai fire, where w the Western governors were really aligned strongly and putting a lot of pressure on Congress to do something. It was out of that that the Healthy Forest Restoration Act occurred. Um, so there was, there was a political momentum in the early aughts that was then eclipsed by the economic declines of the late aughts. And then, um, 
you know, we, we sort of have lost momentum. It's, it's the new normal, which is, a little, is incredibly distressing. Perhaps the California fires are going to re, reignite, bad pun, that discussion. But um, I think we need to more often talk about it as a public safety issue. Um, certainly water's getting its due attention more and more. I think the more we make it, bring it on home that way, the more we might be able to increase our uh, co Congress's um, appetite for doing something. I'm, I'm an optimist, so <laughs> a pessimist might give you a very different viewpoint. Thank you. Uh, yeah.